name's John Guzzo. I'm, uh, I work with LBJ as well. I was actually, uh, I, I came out to Indiana from, uh, I knew Dr. Plank through the Army. We practiced in the military together. And uh, I'm also, I'm a generalist. I'm uh, uh, subspecialty certified in sports medicine as well. Uh, typically, you know, I, I pretty much do it all though, except for spine uh, from head to toe. Uh, do uh, I do specialize in shoulders and knees. Um, so anyways, we're going to talk about labral tears today and uh, uh, does age matter? And unfortunately it does. So um, I'll try and quickly go through a lot of the stuff, especially anatomy, because uh, Dr. Plank hit on it a bunch already. So we'll review uh, the uh, shoulder anatomy. We'll describe the different types of labral tears. We'll talk about the treatment strategies and then discuss some of the post-operative rehabilitation. So in general, the shoulder is made up of uh, three major bones, the clavicle, the proximal humerus, and the scapula. You can think of your shoulder as a golf ball on a tee. And it's that relationship that gives the shoulder such uh, good range of motion um, compared to the other joints in our body, but that's also what lends to the instability that we see uh, with uh, the shoulder. The soft tissue structures around the uh, shoulder are going to be uh, the rotator cuff, which functions in initiation of motion as well as centering the humeral head within the glenoid. The, uh, uh, long head of the biceps that attaches on the superior labrum there, uh, the ligaments in the capsule, and then the labrum, which we're going to talk about today, which is typically uh, described as the meniscus of the shoulder, and that's what lends itself to um, uh, deepening that glenohumeral joint and uh, attachment of the ligament site. So there are two uh, major forces on the shoulder, um, really the static and the dynamic restraints that uh, protect us from instability. The static are the non-mobile uh, restraints such as the uh, labrum, the capsule, and the ligaments, and then uh, the labrum really deepens the glenohumeral joint, and it actually adds to uh, the um, restraint of the shoulder by providing a vacuum effect or a negative intraarticular pressure effect by almost a suction cup effect on the humeral head. The uh, other forces that act are the muscle contraction of the shoulder to include the rotator cuff muscles, uh, the uh, scapular stabilizers, and the long head of the biceps. So there are three major causes of rotator cuff tears. The first is trauma, and with uh, dislocations of the shoulder, they can cause uh, significant labral damage. Typically, we see um, a pattern of either anterior or posterior instability. It can be uh, anterior labral tears that contribute to it, posterior labral tears, or slap tears. Or there's oftentimes actually a combination of these tears where we, see, we can actually see circumferential tears around the entire uh, glenoid. So the um, uh, other causes of uh, labral tears are repetitive overhead motion. As we talked about previously, the long head of the biceps actually anchors at the superior labrum and with repetitive overhead motion, uh, such as uh, throwing, hitting, swinging, anytime you see like Dr. Plank described his uh, uh, patient that was a uh, drywaller and actually I have a case that is a drywaller as well and I'll, <laughs> I'll show you that at the end. But, but so with those overhead type uh, motions, we typically see this result in slap tears rather than the uh, posterior or the anterior labral tears. And then global laxity in patients, unfortunately, uh, this is not caused by work, but we do see patients with global laxity when they're doing their work, their uh, repetitive subluxations can cause tearing or blunting of that labrum. So when evaluating the patient, uh, there's going to be multiple things that we want to see uh, and talk to the patient about to include the description of the pain and the provocative factors that, that cause the pain. But I, I would say with instability, it's uh, what was that episode of instability? Was there a dislocation? Uh, was it reduced in the emergency room or did you self-reduce it? Was it documented? Um, and that's really kind of where we want to see um, in the initial workup because uh, that will help us help guide us uh, either way. Because if there was a documented dislocation, I'll probably approach that a little bit different uh, than if there was not a documented dislocation, especially if the exam doesn't correlate. So, On physical examination, we're typically going to do a full examination of the shoulder, but the actual uh, test that we want to see uh, normally for labral tears are going to be the O'Brien's test, uh, the apprehension relocation and surprise test, the load and shift test, the posterior apprehension test, and the uh, sulcus sign. So with the O'Brien's test, that really looks at the superior labrum. And uh, typically with this type of maneuver, uh, you're going to have pain. And then this uh, type of maneuver alleviates the pain. And that can either be referred from the superior labrum or a slap tear. But we can also see that with AC joint pathology too, where it actually causes pain with the O'Brien's test. This is uh, the apprehension test. You can have perform this either lying down or sitting up. I prefer to perform it lying down. It gives more stability to the shoulder so that you can actually move it around. But typically, um, uh, you want to abduct, flex, and externally rotate, or excuse me, abduct, extend, and externally rotate that arm. And then that will oftentimes cause the patient to have a feeling of apprehension where their 
shoulder is going to dislocate if they have an anterior labral tear or they've had instability in the past. This is actually showing the relocation test where he's putting his, his hand on the shoulder and that should alleviate the symptoms. Just pain in and of itself doesn't, um, uh, isn't a true apprehension test. A patient should actually feel like the shoulder is going to dislocate and oftentimes they'll uh, start to get off your table as you put them in that position. Uh, then there's the load and shift test and that can look at either posterior or anterior instability and it's when we try to move that that uh, humeral head uh, within the glenoid. Oftentimes with somebody with significant instability, you can perch it either anteriorly or posteriorly. We see the posterior apprehension test, which um, uh, will look at posterior labral tears, and, uh, or it indicates posterior labral tears. And oftentimes you don't have a significant uh, movement. It's just more of a reproduction, uh, reproduction of the pain. And then with the sulcus sign, this is, uh, you can see this with ligamentous laxity or rotator cuff interval injuries. And that's a pretty extreme uh, sulcus sign there. So uh, the next uh, part of the evaluation is with imaging. Usually by the time they see us, they already have x-rays that are, have been performed. Uh, we uh, can really uh, evaluate alignment and look for fractures. But if we're suspecting a labral tear or instability, um, we're, most of the time we're gonna order an MR arthrogram. And really the reason for that is because the labrum and the capsule can be significantly uh, better visualized with a um, arthrogram rather than an MRI. And occasionally, uh, if this is a person that had a, a dislocation um, on the job, uh, but they've had significant instability in the past, and they've uh, actually, we worry about uh, uh, bony deficiency, then we'll order a CT scan, or just for better evaluation of fractures associated with it as well. So the findings that we want to look for on our uh, workup uh, or the imaging studies are going to be labral tears, hill sax lesions, which um, are compression fractures of the humeral head uh, on the glenoid whenever it's dislocated, uh, glenoid fractures, uh, we can see increased capture volume from stretching of that uh, capsule whenever it's dislocated, and then rotator cuff tears. And typically those are the patients that are above the age of 40 that we see the rotator cuff tears. And the younger patients, typically when they dislocate their shoulder, they'll fail through the labrum and the ligaments that attach there. And it's the older patients uh, that will fail through the rotator cuff. So here's just an example of some of the findings that we see. Uh, this CT scan shows an anterior uh, fracture of the glenoid. We call that a bank art fracture. Here's um, looking at the labrum itself. So this is a normal looking labrum on the glenoid. So again, think of your shoulder as a golf ball on a tee. And when you have that uh, relationship, it's a, all around that, the labrum is that soft tissue ring that surrounds the entire uh, glenoid. So this is how the labrum should look. It's this black structure in the back. And then on the front edge, you can see it's separated. Uh, this is an example of a, um, a hill sax lesion. And that's where, when the whole humeral head comes out and it perches on that anterior uh, glenoid, that's when we see that impaction fracture of the humeral head. And then if you look at this picture versus this picture, you can see how much more white you can see on these views comparatively than to that. And that's just from that, what we talked about previously, that irreversible stretching of the uh, capsule. So the three uh, different types of labral tears, if we're gonna separate them, but again, oftentimes they're combined and we see anterior, posterior, or slap tears, but we'll talk about them separately now. So anterior labral tears occur um, uh, with the most common type of instability pattern that we see, and that's anterior dislocation. So over 90% of dislocations occur anteriorly, and they'll typically result from trauma, uh, contact or collision sports, and falls. Um, usually we see that uh, mechanism, that, that, that apprehension test that we were talking about where we externally rotate and uh, abduct and extend our arm. So that's what happens. So oftentimes somebody will uh, fall, grab a railing, and their arm will get pulled back, and so they'll uh, dislocate their uh, humeral head. Um, and then the pathology that we see usually occurs in one of two locations, either off of the uh, glenoid, and we see uh, the different various forms of labral pathology here, or off of the humeral uh, side, and that's called a Hegel lesion. Um, but we're focusing on the labrum today, so we're gonna talk about the labral tears. So the natural history study, uh, or natural history, I should say, with anterior labral tears and instability. If you look at the literature, there's gonna be varying rates uh, or reported recurrence rates within the literature from 17 to 96. That's a very, very big difference. And the biggest factor um, that determines whether or not uh, you're going to have recurrent instability is going to be the age of the patient. Um, less than 20 years is when, uh, 20 years of age is when we see uh, those patients have the highest recurrence rate with up to 94%. And that substantially decreases each decade after 20 with patients being older than 40 having a, a recurrence rate of 10 to 15 percent. So you're going to treat those types of patients significantly differently um, with the younger patients. Uh, 
anywhere 18 to 25, you're going to uh, perhaps be more aggressive with your treatment than you would with somebody over the age of 40. So in general for treatment, if you're going to treat a patient conservatively for an uh, anterior shoulder dislocation and a labral tear, you're going to place them in a sling and swath for about one to three weeks, and then you're going to follow that up with PT, working on range of motion, strengthening, and proprioceptive training. So for surgical repair, uh, typically the goal is to restore the normal anatomy, and that's where we want to place, replace that labrum and reattach it to the glenoid. Typically, um, that's done by placing anchors within the glenoid and encircling the labrum, uh, sometimes plicating the capsule if we do have that irreversible stretching of the capsule. Um, you can do this just as Dr. Plank was talking about. You can do this either open or arthroscopically. Uh, the literature shows that the same recurrence rates, uh, same function and outcome. However, I'll tell you that uh, the majority of patients probably these days are, are I, su I should say physicians these days, are going to do that arthroscopically. I agree with Dr. Plank. You can see so much better whenever you're doing this arthroscopically, and you can also visualize any other pathology that's there. So, so is early surgical treatment the correct thing to do? Well, uh, if you look at proven recurrence rates, uh, lost work time, cost, secondary injury, uh, it very, may, very well may be. There's a lot of uh, literature that looks at uh, immediate arthroscopic stabilization versus non-operative treatment, and uh, the recurrence rate and, uh, and re-injury um, is going to be significantly decreased with surgery as compared to non-operative treatment. Um, the biggest factor, though, is, is with age. So basically, when we take that into account, age, activity level, and desire to return to play are all factors that should be considered with early surgical treatment. So for posterior labral tears, uh, it's a much, much less common form of instability, only occurring at about 5 to 10%. Uh, we see this with patients that uh, are electrocuted, sometimes that have seizures, um, but the most common, two-thirds of it, re re, uh, results from trauma or falls. And, and typically, in, in uh, comparison to anterior instability or anterior labral tears where we see uh, dislocations and instability being the problem, uh, posterior insta, uh, labral tears often occur or present with pain rather than true uh, instability. So just like the, uh, uh, the anterior labral tears, we can see that pathology have a reverse bank or, or labral tear, uh, capsular uh, injury, and then uh, uh, bony pathology. So um, the difference between anterior and posterior labral tears, I'll say, is uh, again, just like there's a difference in the um, uh, instability versus pain, uh, most of our patients that present with posterior labral tears are going to be treated conservatively first because about 80 to 90 percent of patients can be treated successfully with conservative treatment for, for posterior labral tears. Surgery is indicated for recurrent instability, uh, for pain or functional limitations following failed conservative treatment. And a lot of times when we see that, it's uh, going to be the patients with ligamentous laxity that have this, that failure of, the, of, of a conservative treatment. And the last type of, uh, of tear that we're going to talk about is a superior labral tear, or a slap tear. It stands for superior labrum anterior to posterior. And it's often associated with uh, pathology of the long head of the biceps. The biceps anchors onto that superior labrum. And with that repetitive overhead motion or traction, you can pull that, uh, that uh, labrum away from the glenoid. You can see here, this is uh, an MRI showing the, the humeral head within the glenoid. And this is a normal attached labrum, and this is an example of a slap tear where you can see the dye or the contrast extending un underneath the uh, superior labrum. So unlike the other two types of tears, um, there's no, not really a truly associated instability with slap tears. It's more of a pain with uh, activity. Uh, the original classification had four different types of uh, slap tears. Uh, the first type one was a fraying of that superior labrum. Uh, type two was where you actually pull the entire labrum away from the glenoid. Type three was a bucket handle tear of the uh, labrum, and then type four had that bucket handle tear that extended up into the uh, biceps tendon. Now, since uh, that original classification, there's been five additional uh, um, types of slap tears that have been uh, um, placed in the classification as well. And really, the treatment depends on the different classification. Uh, but then it also takes other factors in that we'll talk about now. So with conservative treatment, um, the rehab is focused on really uh, posterior capsule uh, flexibility because oftentimes with slap tears, we'll see the, there's a posterior capsular tightness that occurs. And so, and also rotator cuff and scapular uh, stabilizer strengthening. With uh, unlike posterior labral tears, there's only a 50% success rate and 35% of them are able, actually able to return to their pre-injury levels. So 
that's not great numbers, but you still can try to treat them conservatively uh, at first. And then surgery, we look at, uh, as Dr. I will not talk a long time about this because Dr. Plank talked about it, but you can go on to either debride the labral tear, you can repair it, or you can do a tenodesis or tenotomy. And that treatment choice depends on pathology, uh, their age, and their functional level. Uh, for work comp, in general, uh, they're going to be uh, having a tenodesis because uh, their studies have shown for them uh, to do significantly better. However, if they're less than the age of 30, I absolutely would consider doing a repair on them. So the post-operative course for labor repairs, um, full recovery can actually take up to six months. Typically, they'll wear a sling for about three to uh, four to six uh, weeks post-operatively. They'll do physical therapy for about three months. And it's really before around that three months time that they're rehabilitated with all of their um, normal daily activities, but before we allow them to do things such as climbing, overhead activities, uh, and like significant manual labor, it'll be about four to six months before they reach that MMI. So a couple quick cases. I know we're just about out of time. So um, uh, this was a 22-year-old male construction worker. He fell from a roof, grabbed onto uh, some scaffolding to prevent his fall, kind of had that jerk back. He felt a pop and was unable to move his shoulder until he uh, self-manipulated it. Uh, his exam demonstrated a positive uh, apprehension and relocation test as well as surprise test and he had a 2 plus anterior load and shift. His initial radiographs were actually negative uh, but because of his um, exam and uh, the probability of a dislocation an MRA was obtained and the MRA you can see here the uh, posterior labrum is nice and intact and that anterior labrum is off uh, the anterior aspect of the glenoid so this is an anterior labral tear and uh, with uh, he underwent, he was 22, he wanted to get back to his previous level, he was very active and so he desired to have surgical intervention prior to considering um, conservative treatment. And so he underwent um, a labral repair and was back to uh, full duty in four months. Uh, this is a, it's, it's amazing, it's like Dr. Plank and I have the same patients, but this, this is a guy that also fell out of a truck. He's a 48 year old male FedEx driver and he tripped over a package, fell out, back of a truck and landed on his uh, outstretched arm. Uh, he had immediate pain in his right shoulder. He had no feelings of instability, but it just continued pain, uh, especially with uh, trying to push things. Um, his initial radiographs were negative as well. So uh, based on his examination, a posterior labral tear was suspected. Um, and again, since they can uh, recover pretty, uh, pretty darn well, uh, about 80 to 90%, we initiated conservative treatment with uh, physical therapy. He did regain his full range of motion. He felt his strength improve, but he continued to be painful while uh, pushing a cart with heavy packages. So an MRI, MR arthrogram was ordered, and that demonstrated, if you uh, look at the uh, golf ball on a tee, anterior labrum, posterior labrum, demonstrated a posterior labral tear. So he had surgical intervention in which that labrum was then reattached uh, to the glenoid. And here's an example of the final repair. And the last patient is a 54-year-old male drywaller. Again, same patients. <laughs> but a uh, patient started experiencing pain while removing plaster overhead using a hammer. He noticed uh, continued pain while mudding and taping the ceiling seams. His exam demonstrated a tight posterior capsule, positive Nears and Hawkins test, and a positive O'Brien's test. Radiographs demonstrated some degenerative changes of his AC joint, but otherwise really negative. Uh, so, uh, the uh, diagnosis was a shoulder impingement with a possible slap tear. So initially, conservative treatment was tried with a subacromial injection and physical therapy. He pretty much only had 50% relief of the symptoms and continued to have persistent pain with his O'Brien's test, so an MR arthrogram was ordered. And that shows, I wish I had a laser pointer, I didn't have to walk back and forth, but that shows up here. You can see that superior labral tear or slap tear. So secondary to the patient's age and him being work comp, uh, tenodesis was performed. Um, you can see here is the superior labral or slap tear, or the separation of the labrum from the actual glenoid. And that's, uh, as Dr. Plank was saying, the bone spur with the subacromial decompression and the distal clavicle resection. I think that's it, yeah. Good, not too far.